The following interview was conducted with Professor Charles H. Armstrong, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Microbiology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, September the 10th, 2009 uh, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Armstrong. Good afternoon. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and your early years? I was born uh, in 1925 in a little town in central Ohio, Mount Vernon, Ohio. I lived there uh, until I was about five, and then we moved out to New York State. My, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather was terminally ill, so we lived a couple of years in New York and western New York, and then we came back to, to Ohio. And I stayed in Ohio until uh, uh, I left for the Marine Corps. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about high school? Where did you go to high school? Yeah, I went to a high school, a Mount Vernon High School. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't very happy in high school. I'd, I'd done very well in grade school, and uh, but when I got into junior high and high school, they segregated classes according to academic ability, and I was put in one of the advanced classes, and I wasn't very happy with my fellow students, and I started goofing off, and I cut school, and so the upshot was that I, I dropped out of high school and joined the Marine Corps on my 17th birthday. Okay. Well, tell us a little about that. Where, where were you trained, and then uh, how long were you in the service? Okay. Uh, I joined the, the regular Marine Corps, it was not a reserve, which meant it was a four-year enlistment. I joined at Cleveland, Ohio, and went through a Paris Island boot training camp. And uh, then I, I spent some time on the West Coast, and I joined a squadron, uh, a fighter squadron, uh, VMF-124. We were the first squadron to take the Vought Corsair, the, the, the inverted gall wing fighter into combat. So uh, we left San Diego in early January and uh, uh, went to the South Pacific, spent uh, uh, a couple of weeks in the New Hebrides, and then went up to Guadalcanal. And I was on Guadalcanal for about five months, four months, I guess. Uh, had my 18th birthday on Guadalcanal. Okay, kind of a special occasion. But what year was this, sir? When were when were uh, the, would this have been? Pardon? What what year would that have been that you when you were in the service? What were those it was years? 1943. Okay, so you were during the war then, huh? Yes, right. All right. Oh, go ahead. And then after and huh, after Guadalcanal, so fight, we were in a fighter squadron. Okay. And we we fought this, we we flew this big uh, fought course there. I was ground crew, um, but it was we had one of the the most famous flyers in our squadron uh, in the Pacific, a, a man that uh, shot down 23 Japanese planes and was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Who was that? That was Kenneth, uh, at the time he got his award, I guess he was a lieutenant colonel. Uh -huh. When I first knew him, he was a warrant officer. Okay. Um, his name was, uh, um, I tried to tip of my tongue. Um, Kenneth, Kenneth Walsh. Okay, great. Good. Okay, go ahead then. Well, that was, that was pretty much it. Well, since we were uh, uh, at the first, uh, uh, were the first squadron to take that aircraft into combat, um, we had gun cameras. Uh, that is, if there were cameras set up with the machine guns. So when the machine guns fired, the, the cameras rolled also. And they used that footage. Uh, that was sent back to Washington. They used that footage to evaluate the aircraft and so forth. Mm -hmm. And one of my jobs is to develop that aircraft camera film. Oh, wow. And, Pretty good. Good experience. Yeah. Oh, pardon? <laughs> good experience. Yeah. So uh, we, since we were an experimental squadron, we, uh, we were only overseas for about 10 months. We came back in October, and they broke the squadron up and to form new new squadron to take that same airplane. Okay. And of course, that, that F4U airplane, uh, they were still flying that uh, uh, during the Vietnam War. Wow, pretty good. Yeah. You got in on the ground floor. <laughs> okay. Then when did you get out of the, when did you get out of the service? After the war was over? Yeah, well, I, I, 
uh, as I said, I was a regular Marine, so I, I put a full four-year enlistment in. I got out in March of 1946, and uh, so I knew that I wanted to go to college, <laughs> but I didn't have a high school diploma, so I I had to make arrangements with the high school to to uh, to get a diploma so I could start college. Sure. And I fortunately I had taken some correspondence courses, and I'd taken a couple of junior college courses, and I'd had some military training and this, that, and the other thing. And then high school uh, decided that I had done enough to uh, earn my diploma, except Ohio required that uh, every student have a course in, in civics. So uh, they wanted me to fit in the, uh, sit in with the, with the kids, and that would, have, that would have put me behind college for another, another semester. And I talked them into letting me take the final exam. Okay. So I passed that and uh, started at Valparaiso University. Uh, that following uh, June. Okay, in Indiana. I, I did. I did one year at uh, at Valparaiso University, a full twelve months, and uh, applied uh, for vet school at Ohio State, and was admitted to my first uh, application. And I was told, and this was 1947. I started that there were 1,300 applications for vet that that particular class. And, and as I remember, I think we had 70 students in the class. So <clears throat> pretty comp pretty stiff competition to get into vet school. That certainly is. That's right. So did you do your uh, – the pre-vet just was at Valpo, and then you went right into the vet school? Right. Oh, at okay. that time, one year of pre-vet was all that was required. Okay. And I was fortunate in that my grades were good enough that uh, I was admitted after the one year. Okay. All righty. So I got, I got my degree, and then I – I uh, went to Chicago, and I practiced uh, in Chicago, first on the near north side and then out in the suburbs for 10 years before I uh, decided I really wanted an academic career. So that's, uh, I joined uh, the staff uh, uh, at uh, Purdue as a, as a graduate student and instructor in 1961. Okay, okay. Uh, how did you How did you happen to come to Purdue? You uh, you applied as a student then. Is that what you decided to do? Yeah. Well, okay. uh, I had a friend that had a Beechcraft Bonanza, and uh, we'd heard uh, that uh, Purdue had just opened a vet school. Sure. So one winter day, we we flew the Bonanza down to Purdue, and we had a tour of the school, so we knew a little bit about that. And that was about that was about eighteen months before I actually. Uh, joined the staff at Purdue, okay. but we, I decided that I did want an academic career, and I knew the dean at, uh, at Illinois at that time, Dean Branley, fairly well, because I was active in organized veterinary medicine in the Chicago area, and uh, I talked to him several times about uh, uh, possibly going to graduate school, and he encouraged me. He said, you know, they'd really like to have me, so uh, one day my wife and I drove to uh, Champaign-Urbana, and uh, we were interviewed by several people, and they offered us a, offered me a rather attractive position, but we really weren't very fond of uh, the Champaign-Urbana area as a place to live. So I said to my wife, Jane, let's, uh, let's drive over to Purdue and see if they have any interest in uh, offering me a position in graduate school. So we did that, and at that time, uh, Dean Morris was uh, 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 Erskine Morris was the dean, okay. and he wasn't a very enthusiastic. I was uh, I was 35 years old at the time. He thought I was a little bit old to, to start <laughs> graduate education. Oh dear! But he introduced me to Bob Claflin, who was the the, the uh, uh, chairman of the Department of Veterinary Microbiology, Pathology, and Public Health, and. Uh, Bob Claflin was very enthusiastic about my joining the staff, and so we had a nice conversation, and uh, he made me a good offer, and I told him I'd think about it, and uh, he made two or three recruiting calls after I, I went back to, to Illinois to, to resume practice. So the upshot was that uh, in September of 1961, uh, I, I joined the staff. Okay, very good. Now let's take it from there. Then was that the, was the department at that time called what veterinary microbiology, pathology, and was public health? Micro, 
Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, tell us a little about the early days of getting started and getting your feet wet, as they would say. And you got. And where did you live when you uh, came it was a here? Exciting time because the school was new. Right. And the, the staff was pretty small at that time. Uh, they, as I say in '60, well, as you know, they, the school opened its doors in in '59. Yes. So uh, everything was just banking new, and uh, it was really an exciting place to be. The everybody was so enthusiastic, and uh, and you'd uh, had that dedication of the building, hadn't you? In 1960, they de dedicated the building. You know, I don't. I don't particularly. Uh, that was before the you came. Sure. On, no, it was in 1960. I believe so. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I yeah. don't. I don't remember being there when the building was dedicated. Sure, okie doke. Uh, that yeah. was. Go ahead then. Uh, what were, What was your teaching and research? When how'd you get going well, with, I, with that? I started out. I thought I wanted a, a degree in pathology, and um, uh, as an instructor, I was assigned to uh, assist Dr. Uh, Ted Bernstein, who was a virologist, and so to prepare for instructing in microbiology. I got my toes wet in, vi in the virology thing, and I found that really exciting, uh, actually propagating viruses and growing, growing cells and artificial cell culture. And so I changed my major from pathology to virology, and Ted acted as my, uh, as my major professor. Okay. And I, after a couple of years, uh, when, when I, uh, it took me about two years to get a master's degree. At that time, the vet school was pretty insistent that all graduate students get a master's degree before they went for the for the PhD. So I got my, my master's degree from, from under Ted in virology. And at that time Bob Claflin asked me if uh, if I would like to if I would consider staying on and after I finished my my PhD and uh, to teach bacteriology. So I, that sounded good because both Jay and I really liked the Lafayette community and we were very, very happy at the Purdue Vet School. So uh, I said, yeah, I think that would be good. So I changed my major then, I mean, my, my major from virology to, to bacteriology. It was still under the umbrella of microbiology, but I did research in bacteriology rather than virology. Okay. And so got got a, my uh, degree uh, uh, in 1965. Okay, okay. And then did you, what What came next then? What was the, uh, then were you appointed then to the uh, academic rank at that time? Did you have an assistant? Yes, oh. at that, in 1965 I, I was uh, made an assistant professor. Uh -huh. And being older, and I, I, was, I was very fortunate uh, career-wise at Purdue. I, um, shortly after I finished my PhD, I got a rather nice uh, research grant to, to study a, a porcine disease that was caused by a type of streptococcus. And um, I was fortunate enough to be named Teacher of the Year. So I was promoted very rapidly. In a couple of years, I made an associate professor, and I think four or five years after I was an assistant professor, I, I got full professorship. Very nice. So I, con I continued to... Uh, at that time, I taught both microbiology and immunology and did research and had some graduate students. And then in 1975, I went on sabbatical leave, and I spent part of that time in Spain where I, I wrote a, a, developed a, a teaching program um, based upon a central concept of pathology, and, and that's what the department was doing at that time. They would take a, a given disease, describe it pathologically, and then bring in the peripheral things like etiology, the cause of the disease, and treatment, and so forth. And so I developed a, um, a program along those lines, and I, so I, we spent about, I guess, three months of the, the leave down in Spain. And then I went to Aarhus, Denmark, and I studied the, inter studied at the uh, International Reference Center for Animal Mycoplasmas. Mycoplasma is a, is a one-celled organism. It's, it's like a bacterium, except it does not have a cell coat. And it's very fastidious. It's very difficult to, to propagate artificially. 
so there weren't many people that could really deal with this organism and uh, that international reference center they had they had uh, representative strains of every every known uh, uh, species of mycoplasma and so there I learned to to propagate them and develop them and when I came back to the United States we okay yeah I hear you I'm listening go ahead okay very uh, good I very came good. back to the United States I began to, to research a disease called enzootic pneumonia swine, which was caused by a mycoplasma, and nobody knew at that time how the disease was transmitted because no, it was difficult to, to grow the organism and they couldn't get a, couldn't get a handle on it. But uh, it was an, enzootic pneumonia of swine was, was an interesting disease in that uh, uh, it, does, it didn't kill swine. But it slowed down their growth. It would have it would strike swine when they were about uh, 12 weeks old or so, 10, 12 weeks old, and it would uh, slow down their growth, which meant that uh, they were less profitable to raise. It uh, took more feed and took longer to get them to market. So at that time, I hooked up with a former student, uh, Dr. Kirk Clark. Dr. Clark is, was a, a graduate from Purdue. And he'd worked with me in the lab when he was an undergraduate student. And then he practiced for a number of years up in the Rensselaer area. And then he went to Minnesota, and he got a got himself a PhD degree. And he came back, and Purdue hired him in the, in the swine uh, research unit. And so we worked together, and uh, we were able to determine uh, uh, the way the disease was transmitted. And uh, develop a way to control a disease. Very good. So pretty, pretty exciting time. I would say so. How was the funding during those days? Was that uh, helpful as well? The funding, the support? Again, was the, how was the funding support? Was that pretty good during those days? You get some grants? Uh, yeah, we okay. didn't, I didn't have any trouble getting grants. I didn't have big grants, but I usually had a $100,000 grant or so. Sure. And also during the time that I was doing the the research in enzootic pneumonia of swine. Uh, there was interest in um, developing a vaccine for the disease. Sure. And so uh, uh, I was asked to, by a, a, a R&D company, a uh, molecular biology group in San Francisco, to uh, uh, help them develop the vaccine. And so I, I had pretty good support from them for, for the research that we did on uh, swine disease. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, during this time, were you, were you serving on any committees in the school or at the university? Did you, were you at the university senate or any of those committees at all? Or were no, you I, I, I was asked several times to, to um, serve in the senate, but I, I decided that politics really wasn't my bag, <laughs> even university politics. So. <laughs> I declined, so I, no, I never did that. Oh, okay. What about you? You probably were served on some school committees, didn't you, though, I'm sure, over time? I served, uh, yeah, I served on quite a number of school committees. I was on admissions committee for, I don't know, most of the years that I was there, mm -hmm. it seems like. And I was also, also served on the veterinary technology um, committee. Okay. Purdue is Purdue a pioneer in veterinary technology. I, I don't know how much you know about that particular technology, but uh, um, I guess it's, you could say it's sort of the equivalent of, uh, of a nurse in medicine. They, they assist uh, uh, veterinarians, but uh, they're, they're very much in demand by not only practicing veterinarians, but by pharmaceutical companies, and there's a, they, they really are very skilled young people. And um, we, for, we started that uh, program under Dean Stockton. And he hired a, a man by the name of Roger Lukens to be director of the program. And Roger, it turned out, was a very skilled and very dedicated director. And we had a really strong committee. So I, I worked on that committee for probably, I don't know, eight or ten years maybe. And that was, a, that was an exciting uh, uh, committee too because we got, uh, we got these young kids in. And at that time they were mostly female students. Um, but they were such good kids. They were just so eager to learn, and uh, they were well-balanced people. They, 
they uh, weren't just good students academically, but uh, they were kind of kids that had been in athletics and, and church associations and sort of diverse uh, drama and so forth. Yeah. And uh, uh, and they they were a joy to teach because uh, uh, they were more actually more fun to teach than the vet students would <laughs> were, and that they were they were more attentive and and uh, more eager to learn sure. and. Uh, so it was an enjoyable experience. Sure. What about, how, what about, let's talk a little bit about the school. How did the enrollment, did, uh, did that grow over time? The enrollment? Sorry, I didn't understand did the, um, the enrollment in the school and also gra- the graduate program. Let's talk a little bit about the vet school, the enrollment over well, time. Yeah. Because you were on the admission the side. Class, the class was, I think, as I recall, in the early 60s, we had a limit of 50 students. Okay. And then, then we increased that. There was some some grant money from Washington to train people in ancillary medicine, and so Purdue participated in that. And I think I think we jumped our enrollment to like seventy students. And as I recall, we we had seventy students for several years, and that grant money dried up, and we eventually dropped the class back to 60. I believe that's right. Okay, okay. But that's been a long time ago. I retired in 1988. Oh, that's just a short time ago. Time is time doesn't move that fast sometimes. <laughs> what about the graduate program? How did, did that change over time? Did that increase graduate students in the school? I mean, you know, did, I'm, the, I'm, I'm that's all right. The graduate problem. I'm not understanding you. Know. The graduate student uh, program, did that increase over time while you were in oh, the vet school? Okay. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Good. Um, we had a we had an extremely strong graduate uh, program in pathology. Bob Claflin, the head of the of, uh, veterinary microbiology, uh, microbiology, pathology, and public health, um, was a very gifted uh, administrator, and he put together a very, very strong program in descriptive pathology. And so we got some of the best candidates in the country for that, and uh, they were all very successful in passing the uh, the uh, national board. And uh, it was was we were probably the strongest program uh, maybe in the world at that time. Mm-hmm. Okay, does the program still exist? I don't know about I don't know about so much about uh, other uh, graduate programs that uh, I was not, I really didn't stay very close to some of the people in the clinics. I, I worked with them and that uh, uh, when I, after I came back from sabbatical leave, I uh, moved to the animal disease diagnostic lab where I headed up uh, the uh, microbiology section of that lab and so I didn't have as much involvement in teaching and so forth as as I had previously. Okay. So I'm not sure what was happening in the way of, uh, of graduate uh, studies in, uh, in some of the clinical sciences. Okay. Okay. I know we had a pretty good swine program because I'd been peripherally involved with that. Sure. Okay. That's, uh, that's good. And, of course, during your time, the school changed its name from... Um, School of Veterinary Science and Medicine to the School of Veterinary Medicine. I think uh, about 1974 is my records when I was doing some research for the interview. I think Did, that's probably right, right. yeah. Okay. Um, how about uh, diversity uh, in, over your period of time? That uh, is cha- uh, you got Your earliest class, you had two women in one of the early classes at the school, didn't you? There were well, two, two women that, that started, I believe, in the class of, what, 63 or 64? Something like that, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, the, 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 when I'd gone through veterinary school at Ohio State in the four years of professional schooling, I think we only had one or possibly two women. And there was really veterinary medicine at that time was was strongly committed to to uh, farm animals. It's part of the agriculture scene and. The conventional wisdom was that uh, women just weren't strong, big enough, and strong enough to to deal with large animals. So I saw a transition, and when when I got to Purdue, ten years later, uh, there was still some 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 objections on the part of large animal clinicians about accepting more women students. So 
we argued this uh, uh, repeatedly in the admissions committee, and but eventually they came to realize that uh, uh, you don't have to be big and strong to to treat a large animal. You can use chemical sedation. You can you can hire somebody to uh, manhandle them, and uh, so we we went from from just a few women to. Uh, what it is now, I don't know, 60, 70 percent. Yes, quite a change. Uh, they're female right, now. Right, quite a change over the time. And during your period at, at uh, Purdue, what sort of um, place, what did some of the graduates, did they, some of them go into research, or what, what were some of their uh, career paths after they finished and got their degree? I'm sorry, I don't um, understand. After, the, uh, after the, um, got, they got their degree, what were some of their career paths? Did they go into practice or um, the government? Well, you, you, the, 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 the people that got the DVM from Purdue. Correct, yes. Most, most of them went into, into private practice. Okay. I, I would say probably, well, I shouldn't maybe say, say the most of them. Because one of the things about veterinary medicine is there's so many opportunities in, in um Pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, in the military. So we had some people went there. I would guess that maybe 60% of 65% uh, of our graduates went into practice, and the rest of them uh, uh, pursued other careers. Sure. And and over the years, uh, uh, the uh, occupations like uh, zoological. Uh, veterinarians and so forth. That's uh, been a lot more knowledge gained there. So uh, some people do that. Uh, uh, do they? The yeah. Uh, do they? Hasn't over time there been more specialties? Have some of them gone into specialties such as taking care of the eyes or something or similar like that? Right. The, the specialties have, have really increased since. Uh, uh, since uh, I graduated, and, and, and since uh, when, even during the time that, uh, that I was at Purdue, uh, we saw all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, specialty developed in, in uh, clinical medicine, particularly cardiology and, and urology and dermatology. and uh, Also in, in oncology as well, also in the cancer area. Right, yeah. yeah. And I, I think Purdue has been a leader in some of the oncology. That's right, because that cancer center just for starters started in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. It's been here ever since. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, a guy by the name of Richardson, I think, charged that that's started right. that. That's right. Ralph Richardson. That's right, exactly. And we're sort of unique to have it a, not affiliated with a medical center, just be on an academic campus. Right. And, which is good. Okay. Um, of course, every year you have that annual conference, and that's that's been going for a long time, hasn't it? The annual conference for the veterinarians in the state that's held at Purdue every year. And oh, that, the, the conference, the yes, fall conference, right? That's been, oh yeah, that they started that that conference. Uh, they were doing that uh, even uh, before you came, right? The first year I was there, uh -huh. okay. and that was that, that was an exciting time too, because you know that that the choir. It just the, the the men's glee club at at Purdue is just so so outstanding. At that time, uh, the director was a man by the name of Al Stewart. Oh, okay. And uh, it was it was such a thrilling evening, the bank the the, the banquet evening. Sure. But the conference, of course, was was uh, most of the conference. I don't I don't I recall it was about a four or five day, three to five day conference, was uh, on on practical subjects. Uh, uh, most of it for clinicians, uh, where Purdue staff members would make presentations of one sort or another. And uh, our former graduates and other veterinarians from Indiana and from surrounding station, states would, uh, would attend the conference. And of course, they always tried to, to <laughs> have that about the time of a Notre Dame football game. Absolutely. That helps with the attendance. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! Now you served under uh, several deans. When you came, was it Erskine Morris? Was the dean of the school when you came? Erskine, Erskine Mor Morris. Was, oh, Erskine right. Morris was dean uh, from the time. Well, you know, uh, a man by the name of Pat Hutchings uh, was. I don't. I don't know if he was actually named dean or not. But he was. A, if he wasn't, 
name dean. He was the acting dean. Okay. And he 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 died in a I think. I think early 1960, something like that. Yes, that's what I've heard. And I think uh, I think I think Ed Halterman served as interim dean for a short period of time until they hired Erskine Morris. Okay. Erskine Morris had been uh, uh, director of a, a research animal research group at uh, Iowa State University, and. Uh, he was there for, I guess he must have served as dean for about, I'm guessing, f maybe five or six years. Okay. And he was replaced by Jack Stockton. Okay, all right. And then uh, after after Stockton was, uh, would that have been Hugh Lewis that came next? Yes. Okay. And um, was he, he was the dean when you uh, when you stepped down, and or Alan Rebar came next, did he not? That's right. Okay, okay. All right. Um, uh, any other awards and uh, any awards and honors that you'd like to tell the researchers about? You mentioned about the teaching. Any others that you've received over time? No, I didn't. I don't think so. Okay. Oh well. Okay. How about the professional associations? Were you involved? I imagine you were involved with the uh, Indiana and the American Veterinary Medical Association. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, involved in, the, of course, the AVMA, but uh, I didn't. I didn't do much that except pay my dues to that organization. I was very actively involved with the, the swine practitioner group. Okay. Yeah, I thought and also also with the animal disease diagnostician group. Okay. Okay. Because I from 1975 to 88, uh, I was very much involved in diagnostic microbiology. Okay. All right. Good. So, so at that time I was involved with, uh, and those were both good groups, and they they had uh, um, international meetings held all over the world, uh, as did uh, um, another group that I belonged to, the uh, uh, mycoplasmology group. So I, I was able to have some interesting international travel attending those meetings. Oh, that makes it more, even more enjoyable, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little about family. Um, do you have uh, any children? I have two sons. Okay. Do they attend Purdue? or? Uh, my oldest son is an engineer, and he's a graduate of Purdue's uh, uh, Electrical Engineering School. Okay. And my other son is a maverick. He's a graduate of IU. Oh, okay. That's all right. Uh, where's the engineer? Where does he uh, live and work? The one that he's in uh, Grand Rapids now. Okay, and your other son? He's, uh, he's earning right now. He's out of work, but he's a he's a consulting engineer, and uh, so he pretty much works for himself. Okay, as a as a program director. Okay, that sounds good. Um, did you? Uh, where did you meet your wife? Did you meet her when you were at Ohio State? No. Okay. She was in the Marine Corps too. Oh, great! Hey, that's kind of that's sort of a nice thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I was, I was, uh, I, was, I transferred from from uh, a squadron in uh, in uh, Santa Ana, California, El Toro Marine Base, to a school in Chicago. And when I got on the train, she'd just been discharged. She joined the Marine Corps as an underage person, and they found out about it, and they gave her, they gave her an honorable discharge. <laughs> okay. but, uh, she uh, was on her way home, and so. Uh, you struck up a conversation, huh? Yeah, I, <laughs> and I said, you know, it's about my birthday, and she said, well, give me a call and I'll bake your birthday cake. <laughs> so, so that's the way it started. Sounds good to me. Okay. Let's we, and incidentally, just a few days ago, we celebrated our 64th wedding anniversary. Well, congratulations, my best wishes, and I'm sure you blow out all the can you blew out all the candles, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, let's talk. Can you tell us a little about what you've been doing in your retirement? What your retirement activities are? Um, I have two main interests. I, have, I enjoy cooking. Well, good for and, you. And I'm, and I'm I'll be down. Over. I'll be down there for dinner tonight. I'll leave on the next plane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm a wood carver. Oh, how nice! Anything special that you uh, that you like to make? What's uh, up? Most of my carvings are. Uh, I've, I've done a variety of. Things, but for the last 10 years or so, I've carved mostly caricatures. Oh, okay, good. And I've, I've contributed a couple of them to the uh, 
to the Purdue auction. Oh, that's very you know, nice. The vet, school, the vet school auction. Sure. Well, that's very nice. I'll have to try to get there the next time, so maybe I can I can get one of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you, uh, as you look back, do you have a Purdue tradition that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Any tradition of Purdue, such as commencement, that uh, you'd like to that do you have, make a comment on? I'm any, sorry. Any Purdue tradition that sticks in your mind that you'd like to comment on? Such as sometimes people comment on commencement or the Boilermaker special or football or whatever. <laughs> There's a number. No, of, no. Okay. No, I, I just I feel I feel very honored to have uh, um, worked at Purdue University. For I was there from '61 to '88, 20, 27 years. That's good. And they were very very good years. Uh, I think I think Purdue is a is an unusual. You know, it's just an exceptionally good school. Right, exactly. And now, and are, are you planning to come for the uh, the celebration for the fiftieth? Are yes. you and your wife coming? Yes, I am. Well, good. Yes, I am. Oh, that's very nice. Okay. Any? We're looking forward to that. Oh, I'm sure. Um, any closing comments? And uh, as you look back or look ahead, that you'd like to uh, uh, leave it up to you. Well, the only thing I would say is that I can't imagine having a more having had a more enjoyable life than I had at Purdue. Uh, I didn't make much money, but the, the, I, I look forward to getting up Monday morning to go to work. I, I enjoyed my work. I enjoyed the people I worked with. I, I think, you know, some of the nicest people in the world uh, were on staff at Purdue University. Right. And it was just, just a great life. Good. Well, I, thank, I, I want to thank you very much for taking, the, for taking time to the interview, and, I, and my very best wishes, and hello to your wife, and I hope our paths cross. And thank you again, and have a okay, good afternoon. You're very welcome. Bye-bye now. You're very welcome. <clears throat> thank you.